One, two, three, four, five, six. How does it look? Looks good. Are you ready to rock? Clicking live. It's probably already live when you click. Connecting, connecting. This is what we get when we don't prep. It's just stuck on connecting to YouTube. We're good, we're back. Are we back? We're back. Hey, there's White Sea Studio. Nice to see you. Does everybody follow White Sea Studio as well? So um, seeing as I uh, just threw, um, just threw Julianne under the bus and said her boyfriend has a studio, um, am I back? Yes, we're back. Anyway, check out his stuff, it's really good. Um, there's actually a lot of people in the academy that follow him as well. Uh, his reviews are like uh, pretty brutal, so I think they're worth following. They're worth following because he, he takes a very, very uh, um, honest approach to it. And if he doesn't like something, he tells you. And so that's pretty, pretty darn awesome. Anyway, so thanks everybody for watching. Sorry about the good old interwebs. The, uh, um, you know, God bless YouTube and connecting. Uh, Studio Craft, Don, Donald, Tomsey. So what we're going to do is we're going to mix some drums. So for those of you that are in the Academy, you'll know what this is. This was Christian Vey, who is like pretty much a prog rock jazz shredding guitar player. I believe he was about 18, 19, maybe 20 when we did this. It's because it was a couple of years. Well, no, it was about a year ago. And we recorded drums at Sunset Sound and we did it um, with all of the expensive mics and the amazing mic pre's and then we also did it you know with an incredible console we also did it with some inexpensive mics which you know I'm a huge fan of Lewitt mics I just am I'm a good big fan of them because frankly they sound amazing for the price I've championed them right from the get-go right when they get started um, and I They've just been really good to us. They've always looked after all everybody that follows us. So we use their inexpensive mics and we also used an Audient um, I.O. And so we did both. We mixed both the sets of drums. So you get to hear um, both of those. And so I thought I what I would do is I would mix both the drums. This is probably going to be at least two episodes. So we'll call this the part one. Um, and the reason why I wanted to do both is you can hear the expensive drum recording, you know, with the FET and the, and the uh, um, look what we've got here. We've got, we've got a D112 on the inside. We've got a FET U47 on the outside. We've got a Coles microphone. We've got 57 top and bottom on the snare. We've got 421s on the toms. We've got um, hi-hat with a 451 and an SM57 together. Then the overheads are U67s, three of them. Stereo and a mono. Um, we've got a uh, what else? We've got a mono. Uh, 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 we've got a mono room mic, which is also a 67. We've got M49s. I mean, basically, we've got a schnizzle ton of money thrown at this drum sound, and <laughs> we also have all of the Lewitt stuff, which is basically the Lewitt drum package going through an audience. So. It's going to, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix both sets of the drums and you're going to hear, um, you know, you're going to hear what the end results can be. Because these tracks, by the way, are all downloadable. Eric is now going to give you a link where you can, you can, uh, um, um, you can download all of these files. Do, 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 do. Are you Eric? Yes, I am. Okay, so everything at the moment is set to one and two on the drums. So what I'll do, uh, 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 sorry, the session set up super wonky. Okay, so what I'm going to do is, first of all, just create a full drum group of all of these. So we'll call this all, um, we'll call it the sunset drums. I know everything's at sunset, but we'll call it sunset, meaning all of the sunset mic pre's and sunset mics. Um, so I'm going to listen. And the first thing I'm going to do, obviously, is pan it around a little bit. So this is really the first thing I would do when given something to mix, is just get those drum files and make a rough mix without any EQ, any compression. Just go in there and pan it around and do a balance to see where you're really at. 
So at the moment, everything's at zero, so it's going to be all over the place, and everything's panned in the center. I'll go to the end, where it gets a little bit more chaotic. Joking aside, uh, uh, White Sea Studio, yeah, I mean, that's a pretty cool drum mix. I mean, from the perspective of what it is, is it's Greg D'Angelo, who was the drummer of White Lion, um, he was the original drummer of Anthrax, and he's an insane drummer. Um, and it's Tony Franklin on bass, so, you know, who was in the firm with Jimmy Page and Paul Rogers. And so the rhythm section was absolutely insane. Um, and quite often, um, you know, quite often, if we wanted something super, super, super organic, that's what we'd end up with. I'm going to do is obviously we have the benefit of the room mics on this on the Lewitt ones we didn't uh, we had a different kind of setup so let's go over to the Lewitts now so I'm going to come over here and we are going to listen to that recording um, so this first thing we'll do is we'll just make a full drum group so here we go we're going to go to the uh, uh, uh. so we've only got one kick mic one snare top one rack tom mic one each for the floor one hat. Oh, we do have a we do have a stereo pair of rooms. Sorry, the LCT six forties, and we do have obviously two forties as overheads. So super affordable. So we'll call this all drums, Lewitt. Now, also, it's not just the fact that it was a Lewitt. It also went through an audience. So we'll write audience in there as well, just in case we have to reference it. Like I say, this is going to be an ongoing series of videos. Um, so now. I'm going to do the same thing that we just did. 
So we're going to listen to it. It's going to sound quite different because we have less mics. We don't have a snare bottom, so we're not going to get quite that rattle. But this is a lot more realistic idea of what it's like to record drums on a budget. I mean, my guess is it's about $1,500 worth of gear. Give or take a few hundred bucks. So this is about $1,500 worth of gear. Um, like I said, maybe 1600 I don't know. But the point is, it's like very affordable for recording a full drum kit. Obviously, if you're not recording live drums, you can just get away with the two input IO. But in this instance, let's just sort of think about it from a perspective of like, if you want to run a, a studio and you've got like an ID44, which is what this was recorded through, this is what you could do, this. And I believe we extended it as well. You can actually bring in more inputs, but it's a realistic idea of what it would be like to have an entry level studio to record bands. And that was really the point of this. It was just like, can we get the same kind of results? go to the same point in the song. It's going to move that, put the overhead over here. Let's have a look in the room. Now we've got White Sea Studio on here. Um, hopefully he's still here and he can give his opinion. I would say that's a pretty darn good drum sound. Um, bearing in mind is about $1,500, I don't know, give or take a few hundred dollars, maybe it's as much as 2,000. I'm not looking at all the prices. But we went from a drum sound which is, you can't put a price on this drum sound up here. You just can't because this is, this is U67s. It is a console that recorded some of the greatest albums of all time. It's got tons and tons of transformers. It's got API EQs. You know, it's got uh, Domidio, um, uh, Domidio uh, um, mic pre's in it. It's one of the greatest sounding con consoles in the world. When they sell this console, which eventually I suppose everything gets sold, it's gonna, they're going to talk about the fact that it made three or four Prince albums, one of those being P Purple Rain. So this is probably a quote unquote $2 million console that this is recorded through with about $150,000 worth of mics. Obviously there's more kick drum mics and one of those of being the, U, the uh, FET 47 is going to give us a lot more of that air so you're hearing more low end. But if you notice, I didn't print really any compression on this recording. And if you zoom in, it doesn't really, you don't really think much about it, but zoom out a little bit, you'll notice that the pre's themselves, the transients are being rounded off really beautifully. Um, I zoomed in a little far, too far. And this is what lovely analog equipment is doing. Like, if I go in on that, it's doing, it is honestly just rounding it off rather nicely. And that is the beauty of having a gazillion dollars to spend, you know, and going into one of these incredible world-class studios. You've got these transformers that are rounding off the transients. You've got all of this kind of fancy, well, not fancy, I suppose, but beautiful analog equipment. So it's just organically giving me a nice big fat FET 47 kick sound. Have a listen. Yeah, see, look, so White Sea Studio says, to be honest, the cheap sound drums sound like drums I would normally work with during my normal engineering work. And I agree. I agree. I get tons and tons of stuff like that. So um, I have absolutely no problem with working with the Audient 
and the Lewitt mic scenario. I mean, it works for me and there's no, no coloration. This was right straight from, thank you, Mac Joseph. This went straight from microphones to mic pre's print. No compression, no EQ, nothing fancy. And to be honest, the main thing you hear is that extra low end from all those transformers getting involved, all of that analog, you know, circuitry getting involved. You do hear that on the expensive mics, but I do like the snap. I like, what I like about the, the Lewitt stuff in particular, and those people, there's a lot of guys and girls following here that own the same mics, is they're super fast. The transients are, you know, really, you know, really snappy. So you can get a really, really aggressive drum sound if you want it, or a soft drum sound if you don't. Um, it doesn't color it as much. And in some ways, in the digital world that we live in, and like White Sea's pointing out, and that digital world we live in is that like you've got tools, you've got plugins, that you can now take a really well-recorded kit. Because look, have a listen again. This is the Lewitt Audio Combination. I mean, to be honest, I like the way those toms sound. Let's do a, let's do a quick test. So this is the toms. Because one of the things about the beautiful old analog equipment is that it leaves a big sonic footprint in the low mids and the low end. Everything gets really, really fat down there. However, the first thing you end up doing, as I'm sure anybody that mixes drums knows, is pull out a schnizzle ton of low mid. You go in at like 350, 400 and just suck it out. So it's interesting, when I hear those toms, they're pretty nice. Uh, Lisa, the drummer was Greg D'Angelo. Those have got really, really nice air. So let's go to that same section. I haven't compared yet with the 421s, with the, um, with, with the beautiful mic pre's, et cetera, et cetera. sound absolutely fantastic on their own, but they also sound like I'm going to have to pull out the low mids just to get it to work with the bass because they're both going to be fighting in the same area. So what is the advantage? Well, the advantage with the, uh, obviously, a lot more mics, more stuff to play with, um, but the advantage is, quite honestly, is that I've, I can cut more stuff and, you know, I've got more girth in there. What I'd be interested in doing, and I'm sure many of you are thinking this, is doing a comparison mic versus mic. So now what I'm going to do is I'm doing the D112, so just one mic, which was in exactly the same position as the Lewitt. I'm doing a 57 top, I'm doing all the 421s, and I'm going to do uh, the overheads, and we're going to do a direct comparison shot that way. Because that, that will give us an interesting idea with one set of rim mics. So this is going to be interesting, because this is exactly the same amount of mics as the Lewitt. So this is now going to be more about the quality, the expense of the mics, and there's a lot, many thousands of dollars, and the fact that there's this console. Somebody mistakenly said that this console um, would be worth 20,000 now. Definitely not. Uh, this console, I guarantee, would be between one to two million dollars, because it's a specifically handmade for Sunset Sound. Whenever these kind of consoles go on sale, with massive history, with tons and tons of, um, especially one of a kind consoles, because there's only two of these made and they're very different and they're specifically made for Sunset. We saw the Helios go, um, we saw most importantly um, the Pink Floyd one go. They're, they're all fetching one to two million dollars. And that's, you know, not that I'm saying 
there isn't other solutions which could cost hundreds of thousands rather than millions of plus. But this is a very expensive piece of equipment, and deservedly so, with the history and people love that kind of stuff. Anyway, this is now a comparable set of microphones where the mics, the expensive mics, and the expensive console now are the difference. So I, I haven't done this before. So this is going to be comparing this with the Lewitt. hear that um, that low mid stuff in in the toms let's have a listen to just the limit same set of mics well the same mic positions <laughs> It's interesting. Um, one of the big, big differences um, is again that transient shaving that you get with the um, with the other console. You know, it's I always push those mic pre's pretty heavily. So if you look at just the kick in here, it's just like if you zoom out, and I, I don't mean to look, but look at it. It's like there's dynamics in there, but look how smooth those transients have been done. And imagine if it hit tape as well, how much smoother again. But that is what that console is doing. Look at that kick channel there and listen to it most importantly. But it's okay to look to illustrate a point. You know I don't like looking, I like listening. But listen, and the mic positions are in exactly the same place. These mics are like tap touching each other. You could argue that, you know, one is in a better or worse position, but it's, it's combat, you know, it's, com uh, it's a comparative thing. There's a reduced dynamic range because of the transients getting nicely rounded off by the console. Now let's have a listen to the comparable Lewitt. It's actually got some really nice air to it. Really nice air to it. So maybe if we could just like, why don't we do this? Let's go grab something really generic. Um, Let's grab, I have no allegiances with anybody, but let's grab a, a 76, we'll grab the CLA and just put that on. Bypass that second. Go to the other kit. Back to the Lewitt. Honestly, you know, comparable microphones, pr pretty darn good, pretty darn good. Now, obviously, we can, we can blend, um, com you know, we can blend this quite, gene uh, quite drastically, but already, you know, just, I mean, look, more air came out, a little bit more drum bleed came out, obviously putting some compression on it and shaving off the transients. If I go back to the, um, if I go back to the solo on the, if I solo just the D112 on the expensive ones.
Now I'm going to solo just the Lewitt. I think I prefer the uh, I think I prefer the Lewitt there. I think it has some characteristics of the FET blended with the D112 because the FET has the air. Like if we go back up to the FET here, which I'm going to unmute. This is obviously hit really hard the console, but listen. It's very pillowy. I'm going to pull out a bunch of low mids. I could have used any uh, 76. The CLA 76 is great, but I, I would have reached for the bomb factor as well. It's just the first one I saw. It wasn't a particular necessary preference, so I was just trying to use some, you know, compression that wasn't going to color it too much. So that's super pillowy. This one's super aggressive. It's got a lot of snap to it. That's a very ca a huge characteristic. So the two together gives us this. It's nice, but it also feels like I might have to, you know, pull out a ton of low mids, which isn't necessarily, you know, unusual for drum sounds. Let's go back to just the Lewitt on its own with a little bit of compression. He's got a very, very loose front head. Do you hear that? And you hear the puff, 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 puff on the front head. It's not going to, uh, it's not going to, um, it's, it's not going to affect the overall drum sound, but you can definitely like hear the kind of front head moving a little bit. I don't actually care. Um, you know, you can't get too obsessional about how things sound in solo. They not can't, you, you should never get obsessional about solo. How does it sound in context? We're only soloing to hear an issue or to find out what the issue is that we hear. Bye, White Sea Studio. Cool, so that's with the two kicks together and the full drum sound. Let's go back to just the Lewitts. Obviously, the huge, huge difference is that big, that fet that's added, like kind of uh, on it. So it does mean if you've got enough inputs, you could double mic the kick because the fet is on the outside of the other head. You've got both the um, both the Lewitt mic and the D112 were inside the kick drum to give us a decent amount of freedom from bleed. But the FET microphone that was on the expensive drums was on the head on the outside, so it got a little bit of that air. The beautiful thing about the, the DTP, the 640, is I'm hearing a little bit of extra air that the D112 couldn't get, which is nice. That's really rather nice. Um, okay, so where would we go from here? Well, if we stick with the cheaper, the more affordable setup, which is the Lewitt microphones going through the audience, we could do a couple of things. We've already done something that's kind of nice. We've added a little bit of uh, compression to it. So it's rather tasty. I think one thing we could do then, um, now obviously there's a lot of, of bleed that's being compressed by this kick that's coming out.
Yeah, it's interesting. Somebody, uh, Andy, just pointed out something. Yes, I actually think the Omni Channel is the perfect, you know, is the perfect fix in this situation because it has that, well, remember, it has that thump to it. Remember the thump on that? So we'll go over to Waves, um, and we're going to use any mic pre, any, sorry, any plugins by anybody. So if you guys have ideas of things you want to hear, it doesn't matter who they're made by. We have no allegiances on plugins here. This is just mixing drums. But we are going to go for the Omni Channel because I do think it would be rather interesting in this situation. However, I don't see it, which is rather silly. Oh, it's because it's Shep's Omni Channel, not just Omni Channel. Sorry, Andrew. So this is now going to be in place of our 76. Uh, it takes a little bit for the first instance of the Omni Channel to always open. Um, OK. So in bypass. Let's put it on. Nothing works until you hit something. The first thing I'm going to do is just go for the thump. So let's do 2 dB of thump. And we'll go in and out and see what that does. So this is with it on. It's nice. I'm not afraid to try 4 dB worth of thump. That's rather nice. I don't know if I want to put any saturation on yet. There's a temp. If I put some saturation on, it would be really, really slight. Um, so what I might do now is move over to two things, darking out a little bit of low mids. And what I like about what Andrew's thought process is, it's very similar to mine. It, he defaults at the right place. So if you see his mids here, like um, he goes here, he's got 2.8, and this one here is at 3.50, which is that ugly place. It just defaults to it. It's perfect for drums, those low mids. So let's do a little cut at 3.50. And you see what happens here. When I engage something, the, it lights up. So if it's not lit up, it means it's not being used. It's very intuitive. I do like that. Okay, so I engage a little bit of compression. It's giving us between 1 to 3 dB. What I like about it, and you're probably noticing, is it's taking some of those little, um, little softer ones and just kind of letting them breathe. I suppose what I want to try next is just see how effective this gate could be, just to see if we can bring out some of it. I actually don't mind that bleed at all. This is a natural sounding, this is a prog rock track. The bass playing was um, Tony Franklin was absolutely amazing. That's a pretty intuitive gate. That's pr pretty amazing. Um, what we're going to do though is we're going to bring the floor back up here and let some of the bleed come through.
So now what I want to do is just increase my release time a bit. I've let quite a lot of the bleed come through, but it's just, if you take, you hear me take the gate on and off, it's, it's not allowing quite the, um, quite the, the, the sort of ooh that I want. I'm now doing a little balance between having the floor and having the release perfect. Because as the release gets longer, it's also picking up the bleed. So it means that I can bring the floor back. See the balancing act between the floor and the release here. That's pretty perfect to me. Now, if you hear me go in and out of bypass, I think this is now doing everything that we wanted to do. We got the thump. God bless that 4 dB thump over here. The thump is fantastic. That we absolutely love. So we got the thump. We pulled out the 350, the kind of ugliness there. We haven't done any additional attack. I'm not, at this point, I'm not interested in adding any additional track, uh, attack until I hear the rest of the drums. The thing that's inherently good about the modern mic, the Lewitt going through the audience, is it's super snappy, so I'm hearing enough attack. That's pretty tasty. So it's still got the oh uh, of the air of the kick that we want. It's nicely controlled. The bleed doesn't increase because of the gate. Just so, but we got a nice thump and we got a nice, far more controlled compression on it. So great plug-in, worked really, really well on the kick here. Okay, let's go to the snare. Um, but I'm gonna listen to all the drums, obviously, together. And we've been talking. If I wasn't talking, I would have moved twice as fast, but that's the whole point. And I'm staying in solo because I need you to be able to hear what I'm doing. But let's hear it as a whole. I like, I like that I'm hearing the ring. I really do like hearing the ring on the snare. So let's, let's have a listen to the snare in solo and see what we've got. A ton of beautiful grace notes. I'm not hearing any bottom snare. So what, what we're gonna need here is an ability to compress and bring out some of those grace notes. We're gonna wanna hear the snare to be brighter just so we hear a little bit more bottom snare and we hear a bit more snap. Um, and I'm tempted to obviously put a little bump at some of the low end there just to give it a bit more body. So just to recap, so just to recap what we're going to do is we're going to look to control a bit more compression on it, a bit of compression on it, I should say, to catch some of the peaks, but also more importantly, to bring out those grace notes and then add a little bit of brightness on the snare just to help it bite and bring out the bottom snare and a little bit of body on the snare as well. So let's open, you know what, let's grab another Sheps. It's going to be an all-in-one. Sheps is going to, going to win for the drums. Hey, why not? Uh, 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 so give me a second. We haven't gone to any any esoteric. I think this is probably about the most esoteric plugin we, we're using is the uh, is the Sheps here. Uh, 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 here we go. So I think the th first thing I want to do is just brighten it. Um, if we grab this, you'll, you'll see that um, it's an 8K, and it's pretty wide. 
Um, you know, it's a shelf, but let's have a look. And then you can control the queue here. Um, if you go in, uh, we can change it. So there's a queue control here, or we can just go here with the shelf. Let's just try the shelf. So it's going to be an 8K lift, and maybe I'll drop it down a little bit to more like five or six. Have a listen. It's definitely nice on the little extra bite. It's not really bringing out a ton of the bottom snare because it's only a single snare top mic. Let's go to some high mids and see what we can do. Now in solo, it's bright. It's definitely super bright. In solo, it's got a, like a lot of snap to it. A lot of that ong is more about 600-ish. Let's have a listen. So I've tugged out a tiny bit of 600. Now I want to go down to the lows. At the moment it's set to 92, which isn't bad actually, um, because if we, sh if we go lower than the bottom end and boost it, it will catch some of that. There's not a huge amount of kick bleed in there, so I'm not too worried, but let's do that. Now it's here, it's getting better. It's sounding better, but it is definitely increasing a little bit of that bleed from the kick. So I'm gonna take that EQ and take it a little bit higher and see where it still fills in the low end of the, of the snare, but maybe, gets away, but maybe gets away from the kick drum a little bit. So now I'm playing a little bit of a balancing game. So what I'm doing is I'm boosting some of those like lows at about 220, which is classic Neve EQ place on a snare, classic EQ. So I'm boosting that, but I'm also pulling down some of the lower mids afterwards because I'm, I'm sort of the, 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 there's a nice bloom at about 220, but also it's pulling up a little bit of ugliness. So I'm playing a bit of a game. I'm boosting and cutting above it. Take the EQ off. Put it back on. Nice, still got some spankiness to it. Now I'm gonna put a bit of compression on it. Now the question is, if we get a gate in there, some of those grace notes are as loud as the kick. There's a few things we could do. We could sidechain the kick compression into it, and maybe we'll get to that a little later. That's a really nice trick, but I don't think we'll do it yet, but it's a nice trick that you can do where you actually duck compression every time the kick hits. Um, but let's not quite get there yet, but let's, let's keep it in mind. You know what, I am gonna do it. I'm gonna do a little bit. So we're gonna have the kick play. 
So let's listen to the kick and snare together. I want to listen to all the drums. You're really seeing inside my mind, this is how I work. So that I'm still thinking about maybe ducking that, but on reflection, the biggest problem I'm hearing now in the drums in general is just kind of a buildup of low mids. I'm hearing a lot of And before we get into like automating stuff and maybe pulling out um, you know, things between tom hits, all of which is valid, I'm gonna kind of just solo up a couple of things. I wanna listen to these overheads, let's have a listen. Now let's go to the room mics. That's a big offender to me. You hear that? It's kind of, let's go for something super generic. We'll go to anybody's make. Why don't we go to Avid? It comes free. So we'll go to free EQ, uh, 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 which I can never remember what it's called um, because it's not called EQ. Um, why would they do that? Why would, oh, it is called EQ. One band, let's go to the seven band, just in case. Okay, I don't know. For some reason, I'm thinking of their, um, their gates and stuff. They call it something else. Anyway, so now I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna dial up about 350 here-ish, and I'm just gonna tug out a whole bunch of that. Also, what I'm gonna do, and I do this all the time in the room mics, is actually fold out and get rid of the super, super lows. Because I don't want phase cancellation, polarity issues between the kick drum, like big booming kick drum that I've just created using the Omni channel, interfering with the low end um, anything else because then what's going to happen is I'm going to get like a smearing and this is where high passing becomes your friend So we're going to engage that and we're going to go up to like maybe um, Maybe around about a hundred ish 80 hundred just start around about here and see what it sounds like And what I'll do as an illustration is I'll drop the kick drum in and we'll take the EQ on and off so you can hear what it's doing You hear how blooming and huge and beautiful that, that kick drum is? Now put it in bypass and have a listen. Suddenly the kick drum does not breathe. Put it in by, put it, take it out of bypass, listen to it with the low end removed and the low mids removed from the room mics and listen again. It's gorgeous, it's simple, and it's gonna become something that'll become a reoccurring theme, which is like, give the kick drum some room to breathe. You don't have to get in there and get totally surgical or remove 60 hertz from everything, but just gently roll off some of the lows in mics that don't need it. Because otherwise you've got like multiple mics, like you know, four, five, six microphones, all picking up like 60 hertz where the kick wants to sing, all slightly in different positions. So you get this horrible mud 
and it's a thing we talk about all the time, that sort of naivete about don't high pass, definitely high pass if you want clarity. You don't have to get there and do brick wall like removal, but gently removing some of those super lows or decreasing them is going to let it shine. It's not going to give you that phase cancellation and that mud that we hate. Okay, everything together now. All we've done is pull out some low mids out of the room mics since the last time you heard all the mics together. Let's have a listen. Okay, so I have just been informed by young Eric Von Derrickson, we're also doing a giveaway for David Nozzi. Now, do you know David? Um, David has uh, that great channel called Mixed Bus TV, so go check him out. As you can see, we're all about um, sharing knowledge here. We have White Sea um, earlier on, fantastic channel. Mixed Bus TV, as I'm sure you follow as well, is a wonderful channel. And David did a couple of courses with us, and one he did was with my very good friend, Matt Starr, who is the drummer um, presently for Ace Freely, but of course has also played drums with just about everybody. Um, you know, yeah, and is absolutely amazing. And so they did a course on recording drums. So we're going to do a giveaway. We're going to give away three copies in the next half an hour. So stick around. Please do me a favor and hit that like button. I forgot to say that. I see 165 people have hit liked and there's 450 people on. So please, please hit um, uh, it, the mixing. Uh, please hit the, <laughs> hit the like button. That would be absolutely amazing. So I think the next thing I want to do where the drums are at the moment is look for a couple of other sort of places. Um, you know, do some generic kind of obvious EQ points. And I think overheads again, let's go back and listen. Now, the giveaway is, what do we want to know? I would love to know, um, first of all, please hit the like button. That would be absolutely amazing. If you haven't already subscribed, please subscribe. We're, now that I'm back for a little bit, um, we're going to do as many live streams as we can on mixing. Um, so what, um, what I would like to do is, um, hmm, I'd like to know is, do you record drums? And if so, what is your setup? And if you don't record live drums, you can enter to win by saying, no, I don't record live drums because not everybody has a drum room or access to it. But if you do record live drums, tell me what it is. Is it like, is it like an eight mic setup? You know, give us just a little bit of information, what the interface you use. I, you don't have to write me a whole story, but we love to know how everybody does it. I think probably, why don't we focus on like the mics? How about that? What are the mics that you use to record drums? And if you don't record drums, you, you can say, no, I haven't recorded live drums. And in which case, you can still be entered. We're picked at random. Now it's up to Matt. I don't have as big an issue in there in the low mids, but it is there. Um, I think if we go to the toms, that's where we're going to really hear it. So what am I doing? I'm listening to the overheads and the, um, the overheads with the toms and making sure that they're panned so they fit with the overhead imagery. I'll say that again so we don't miss it. What I'm doing is I'm listening to the overheads and the toms and I'm panning them so they fit in the imagery so that the toms match the overheads. 
and I've gone to the low tom, which is occasionally playing, and having a listen. It's a little wider, a little bit wider, so let's go to like 80-ish. Now, let's go back and listen to the other two toms. First thing I'm going to frankly do is make a group of just the toms. So we'll call these toms, Lewitt, uh, and it's name check audience as well, so we remember what they are. I'm going to come out of my groups here and just turn them up. Simple as that. Digging that. So what I've done is just literally turn them up in the mix. If I put the, all the drums together now, I think the toms are gonna to be in a much better place. So this is the whole mix together. tasty. So what have we done? I mean, that's starting to become like a drum sound that I could use. That is a drum sound that's really tasty. So compared with the, um, the situation where we had, um, what we've got here is like $1,500 worth of gear, maybe $2,000 worth of gear to record Lewitt microphones, Audient IO. And again, look, I am a fan of those companies, but I'm just making a point that inexpensive microphones, inexpensive interface. There are many, many other companies that do great products. I like those, it doesn't mean that I'm not going to do other ones. If you know one of the big videos we have is Shure Microphones with Focusrite I.O. So it's more of a point of affordability. So we don't have the girth and the big kind of, um, you know, low end and stuff that we were low mids that we were getting from the expensive mic pre's, the, the, the million dollar console from Sunset Sound, which is amazing. We don't have that. But what we have is control of volume, low mid duck and about three plugins. Well, four plugins so far. And that's dramatically changed the drum sound. So just rebalancing, minor amounts of EQ and compression, and now suddenly we've got a better drum sound. So what's, what have we learned? We've learned that inexpensive equipment can work. What's most important about this? A really good drummer. The drummer is making the biggest difference in this. A good drummer and a decent room. That's it. Good, room, good drummer, good room, and mic's in the right place with some decent amount of EQ and some rebalancing, and we've got a good drum sound. It is gonna get better still, but now we're in a place um, where I really, really like it. It was a Ludwig kick, kit. Listen to those overheads a second. So the hat is picking up quite a lot of bleed from the cymbals. Um, I'm going to bring the hat down.
Let's go to a section which may have a more predominant hi-hat. Let's have a listen. Great question. What advice would I give to drummer? Uh, the what snare, what drums? Ludwig, Ludwig, and Ludwig. It's a superphonic. Um, actually, it might have been a Black Beauty. Yeah, it was a Black Beauty. But yeah, it's, it was all Ludwig kit. Now, uh, what advice would I give to the drummer? Play your kick and snare and toms like you mean it, and make sure you back off the cymbals. It's as simple as that. When you get the younger drummers come in, or not even age thing, when you get the less experienced drummers come in, the first first 99% of the time, the biggest thing they do is go boom, da, ba dum dum da, da ba dum ba dum. <laughs> That's it. It's one of the biggest problems. They go da da ba dum da ba dum, and they hit the cymbals like their life depends on it. And then what happens is your room mics pretty much are, and they're unusable. So a great drummer, a guy like Greg D'Angelo, is like kick, snare, a kick, kick, snare, go da ba dum da ba dum, kick, snare, and the cymbals are balanced. So that's the number one thing. Start with the young or the inexperienced drummer. Or it's not even so much inexperienced. It's sometimes it's guys and girls that have played live a lot. They're so used to the live experience where everything is shrill and high midly and everybody's trying to compete for the same space. Studio drummers do two things. They play their cymbals super, super balanced. They play, you know, with all of their drums balanced. But secondly, they set their drums so there is good separation. So they'll have the snare here and they have the hi-hat over there. I've never worked with a great studio drummer that has the hi-hat next to the snare. Never. Doesn't matter if it's Vinnie Carluta, Victor and Drizzo, Blair Center. They've all got like that much space, at least between their snare and their hat. It's a big, big deal with, with, because otherwise you've got a snare and hat like this. It's fun for drummers to have everything flat and really close and all the cymbals. But try being the engineer. Every time you hit that cymbal, your tom mic becomes completely useless. Because it's just da doom da da ba so it's a big, big thing, um, you know, big, big thing for drummers. So I'm not going to do it yet, but I think what we're learning here with the hi-hat is that what we should be doing is we should be um, taming it. So the problem is, is that when he's going to the right symbol at the end, there's quite a lot of bleed, but he's not playing the hat. So what I'll probably, quite frankly, do is just turn the hi-hat mic down at the end. Just some simple automation. So no clever gating, no clever compression, no clever EQ, none of that clever stuff. Just turn it down. So let's have a listen. Like I want it louder there, but here. I'm rarely, rarely hearing it. And to be honest, I'm fine with it. The, yeah, the biggest problem I have is when he goes to the ride. There's some very, very occasional, like two or three times he uses his foot. And sometimes there's no substitute for doing some little extra work. What do I mean by that is like, you know, getting in there near the end of the drum mix and turning down the hat, except for those occasional It's just, it, there's gonna be like five or six instances in this whole last section where you're gonna to need to just automate those foot parts up ever so slightly. And that, you can spend hours with gates and EQs and compressors. I mean, I get this discussion all the time with people telling me that they couldn't find the right de on the vocal and they spent two hours de the vocal, trying this plugin and that plugin and this plugin. And you know what I say? I'm like, did you think about just listening down and as you're going down in volume automation, just turning the breath down? Sometimes we, we always want a plug-in. I think we're, it's, we're, we're conditioned to think that there's an app for everything, aren't we? We're sort of conditioned to think that, oh yeah, there's an app that's gonna solve this problem. Sometimes it's simply just do the work and it's 500 times quicker. I have a friend of mine who is, an, uh, who is a, uh, a editor 
um, for film and TV, and he does special effects. And he's been doing it for many, many years. And sometimes he says to the companies, there's better ways of doing it than doing it uh, because he's done special effects his whole life, this is, there's better looking ways than trying to do it in digital. And he saves people hours of work by thinking that way. That is what experience tells us, is like it's okay. It's okay to sometimes just automate it down rather than spending two hours trying to find a plugin which solves the problem. Anyway, moving on, I do want to duck out a bit of low mids and stuff out of the overheads. And I'm actually going to just copy my room mic settings across on the EQ and maybe relax them a little bit. Let's have a listen. Already like it. Already like it. Let's put the whole thing together. Oh, somebody wants to hear it with the bass guitar? Sure. It's a good idea. I don't I haven't got a bass guitar mix up, so I'm gonna bring this bring this down and blend in. But yes, that's that's a good point. Because we are spending a lot of time here talking about the drums, and we normally would be moving backwards and forwards through the elements. But yes, good point. Now, this is super, super low tuned, and the reality is, is like I need to shave some of the low end off of the, off the bass, just a bit, because it's interfering with the kick. But it's giving you an idea. We're not doing a bass mixing thing here, but that would be the next thing I would do if I was moving through the song a little bit more rapidly. We're obviously talking and we're discussing stuff, but yes, a little bit of, um, you know, shaving of that off would be really, really tasty. That's Tony Franklin, who the, was the firm's bass player with Jimmy Page and Paul Rogers. So, and the, the, the drummer is Greg D'Angelo, who of course was the drummer, the original drummer of Anthrax and the drummer of White Lion.
Uh, trick. Oh, thank you, uh, Sinoja Anthony. Is there a trick to that? Yeah, I, I would be looking more in the 1-1K um, and less in the tss. The thing with the ride, if he's going to the ride, the drummer, he or she's going to the ride, you're... You're, you're going to be listening more for the gong, 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 gong. Find that place, not the pss, pss, pss. That's what's messing with your guitars. If you're, going to bo if you're going to boost three, four, five, six, seven on a ride cymbal, that's fine, but you're right. If it's a heavy guitar, it's going to get all lost in the sizzle of the guitars. So try and find the bell-like tone. It could be anywhere from like seven-ish, 700 to one to one five K. Just kind of get the ong, dong, 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 dong. So when they go into that, your ear is pulled to that area. Don't go bo boosting too much high mids and high end on the cymbals because that will just, as you say, blend into it. I'm glad we put those instruments in. I'm gonna take them out, including the bass. Um, the bass obviously needs some super lows shaved off it, but also we need to get in there and take out some low mids. They got really boxy, those toms, when they came in. On their own, it sounds nice, but as soon as everything else is in, they sound super, super boxy. We're gonna, so we're gonna come in and pull some of that out. Okay, let's do another giveaway. We still got two more giveaways to go. 425 people watching, that's amazing. Thank you ever so much. Please hit the like button, first of all. And my next question is, is we talked about drum recording. I suppose drum mixing. Do you have a favorite plugin that you like to use on drums? Is there a favorite plugin? Now, I think I'm thinking sort of EQ and compression. We can get into reverbs and stuff like that later. But when it comes to like a reverb or EQ, uh, sorry, uh, EQ or compression plugin, you've seen that we're using either stock or we've been using the Sheps Omni Channel. What is your favorite? What do you usually like to use? Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to these toms and have a listen because we want to get rid of some of those boxing. This is to win uh, the drum recording uh, course. And the last time, one we're going to do in about 10 minutes is we're going to do also a year's membership to the Academy. Once we start putting the rooms and the overheads in there, that kind of definition on those toms gets a little lost. So I'm going to do a couple of things. We're going to, I'm just going to grab um, a generic EQ again. Um, not getting fancy, I'm not trying to color it. I'm just going to grab a generic one. So we'll go back to a seven band because they don't eat, eat up much on here. I'm going to, you know, on all of the toms, just remove some super lows. We don't need them humming along around there. I'm going to get to start with this rack and have a quick listen. I think the first thing we'll do is pull out some of that 350, 400. Already better. I mean, that's a dramatic difference. So that's just like 400, 350, 400, tugged out, um, some low lows taken off, but then some boost at about 100-ish, quite dramatic, and it's already better. So now let's take that, and I'm just gonna copy that exact one down to the, uh, to the floor. We might get, this is the first of the two floors.
<laughs> User error. Adjusting the wrong one. So what I've done there is um, I'm keeping the same kind of low boost, but I ducked out more low mids and it's really helping the low end sing. I mean, dramatic difference, dramatic difference. Um, so, and it's quite drastic EQ, but I've, I needed to do more of that on the floor than I did on the rack. Now I'm gonna copy that sound down to the low, low floor. And let's see what we got there. Let's remember to click on here, so EQ in the right one. Already love it. Put the three together. Throw the whole drum mix together. Put the bass in, which we already know we have to remove some more low lows, but let's check it out. Cool, so what I did there is like, um, the drums were sounding great on their own, but I was still hearing a little bit too much thickness in the low mids. We brought out, we brought out the low mids out of the toms, we brought them out of the rooms. I think there needs to be more taken out of the rooms, believe it or not, and more taken out of the heads. And now I'm taking out more of, in, in the kick as well. It's always compounded. The bass sound is not the final bass sound, but it was an indication and a help of what we should do. So I'm gonna make this a little broader. So I'm gonna make that, Q wider, and I'm gonna duck more in the overheads. And the same thing is gonna be true, I'm gonna do a similar thing, and duck more in the rooms. No budget on Mike Prees. I mean, any of the classics. Let's be honest, any of the classic mic pre's are gonna give you a great job. It becomes very, very opinionated, but the reality is, is like, if you had no budget, you would buy, you know, a beautifully restored Neve 80 series console, an 8028, a 38, something like that. Um, or of course, an API console. I mean, those are classic drum recording consoles. It's not to say that an MCI wouldn't be great if you got one of the early ones, um, a 70s one, but ultimately when it doesn't come to a budget, we can argue about which sound you prefer, but when it doesn't come to a budget, if that's what you're talking about, that's what people do. However, I love the Sunset Sound uh, consoles. They also make their own pre's, which are phenomenal.
results. Let's do our last giveaway. Thank you, everybody who's watching. To have over 400 people here the whole time has been phenomenal. I really appreciate it. Thanks, everybody that came to watch this. Um, be nice to get the 400 plus likes. So if you can hit the like button of the 400 plus of you watching, that'd be amazing. Um, and this is now the big giveaway. So we're going to give away the drum recording course with David Nazi and Matt Starr, world-class drummer Matt Starr. We're going to give away that course. We're also going to give a one-year membership to the Academy. And I suppose what I want to know is, because people are touching on the mic pre's and stuff, is what interface do you use? When you're recording drums, guitars, keys, what interface do you use? And if you just use the onboard PC or Mac, um, you know, that's fine. Whatever you use, just let us what you, what, know what you knew, use, and at random we'll pick it. So please, first of all, hit the like button, and then tell us what kind of interface, what way do you change analog to digital information? What is your converter, your interface? And we'll give it one more listen. I think I am very, very tempted to say the thing that I would like to do is make the room sound bigger. So there's a couple of things we could do. We could add specifically reverb to the snare, or we could put the reverb on the room mic. So why don't we go something super, super generic? Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go reverb, and I'm going to go avid. So let's see what um, avid reverb comes up. I don't know what their free one is, so I might mess it up. I might not go, because we have, we have a more expensive version, but I'm going to go to reverb one just because I can. Um, I don't know if this comes free with Avid. I think it does. And I'm actually going to take, I'm going to make it like a, a two second room, like a 1.7 room, say. And I'm, I'm going to leave everything else pretty standard, but I'm going to take the mix down to zero and then re-blend in. We've got stereo width, here's the mix. So we're going to go full dry and we're going to blend it back in and see if we can just make our room mics feel just a bit bigger. Often, I like that already. Often what happens, especially when you start pulling out some of the lows and stuff like that, is the cymbals start to, they're, they're pretty balanced still. But what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to grab a de -esser. So let's get a de um, whatever the first one that comes up. Here we go, de -esser. And I'm just going to run a de first on all of the mics. So what we've done is we've put a room mic on that. I want to get the decay to be in time with the kick and the snare. What do I mean by that? I want the decay to not last so long that the it goes from like out of the snare into the next kick. So let's shorten it just a little bit. Now I'm going to drop it into the full drum mix. And if you haven't uh, hit like, please hit that like button. That'd be absolutely amazing. And let, let us know, what interface do you use? This is to win the David Nozzi with Matt Star drum course and also a one-year thing. Oh, we already got a winner. Pete, Peter Danielson won. Uh, what did Peter say? Uh, uh, he uses a Focusrite 6i6. Marvellous. All right. I'm now going to listen to the room mics now with the full drum kit.
already without doing anything to the bass guitar, now the bass, and, and there's still going to be a EQ applied to the bass. Now the bass and the drums work really well together. You hear the toms, what was happening, we were adding the bass and the toms started going like this. Now with the bass in, even before EQ, the toms are starting to sing around it. People clapping there at the end. Thank you ever so much for everybody that joined in. Please do me a favor and hit that like button if you haven't already on your way out. It means a lot. Um, really, 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 really love doing this. It's great doing the live streams. Um, thanks everybody that tuned in. We'll be back. Um, I think we'll be back probably next Tuesday and follow up on some drum stuff and all the other good things. Um, thank you ever so much, everybody, for watching. Sorry about the little YouTube hiccup at the beginning, um, but please come back and join us and have a marvellous time recording and mixing, and uh, I'll see you again very, very soon. Thanks a lot. Hit the like button.